All righty. So welcome uh, to this month's uh, edition of our Hear from the Speaker or Hear from the Expert series um, with our DNR expert speakers. Today we're going to be uh, hearing from Ron Weber about caring for our public forests. Before we get started, really quickly, well, maybe the touchy mouse today. Um, I just wanted to remind you that LEAF is sponsoring these monthly speakers uh, in an effort to help build your content knowledge and information about forestry in Wisconsin, because that's one of our main missions here in LEAF, is to connect formal and non-formal educators with quality forestry education materials. My name is Gretchen Marshall, and I am a staff member here at LEAF. And overall, I kind of focus on state uh, school forests in the state. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But I know that we have a few other LEAF staff members on the Zoom meeting here as well. So if you would just quickly unmute yourself and say hello for us with your name and just a, a really brief snippet about what you do in LEAF, that would be great. I'm Steve Schmidt, and I'm helping Gretchen um, monitor the chat and admit people who might show up still. And I uh, really enjoy working for the LEAF program, especially in conjunction to the School Forest program. Thanks, Steve. Uh, I'm Nicole Filizetti. I'm here with LEAF um, with the Project Learning Tree program and um, professional development and other, other tasks and projects as well. Nice to see you all. Thanks, Nicole. And I'm Kate Flick, and I do a lot of professional development and create different online modules now and videos and all sorts of new virtual reality stuff. Yes, wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, so LEAF is a partnership between the uh, Wisconsin DNR Division of Forestry and the Wisconsin Center for Environmental Education. Uh, we're located here on the uh, campus at UWSP. We're a part of the College of Natural Resources. And if you take a really quick look at that map of where we go and what we do in the state, you'll see that um, I mentioned school forests before. Uh, Nicole uh, coordinates our PLT program for the state. And you can see the, the red dots of um, some of the um, places we've been for PLT and more than what's up there. And then also uh, professional development opportunities where we go and we do a lot of outreach. So um, I think just keep in mind that while uh, this year has been unique and so one of the ways we're bringing you professional development is this way, um, don't ever hesitate to reach out to us uh, because we're more than happy to work, uh, work with you no matter where you are in the state. So how do we do that? What does LEAF offer? Uh, I just mentioned professional development. Uh, in normal times, we like to go to you through staff trainings at your school or workshops. And um, in these days, uh, we've been trying to bring the workshops to you online or additional content knowledge to you online. We do have curriculum materials, uh, if you're not familiar with the LEAF lessons uh, that can be used in the classroom and outdoors. They're on our website, they're free to download. Uh, we have hands-on forestry education kits that are available. So if you need tools, to help you teach about forestry, our forest um, tree measurement, forest health, forest products, feel free to take a look for those. And then as we mentioned before, we provide support for outdoor classrooms uh, through Project Learning Tree and to our school forests. And the website is listed there uh, and all of those things can be found or more information about them can be found on our website. So feel free to go there and take a look for all of that and much more. And without further ado, I would like to transition into our speaker for today. So Ron Weber is a forest ranger and he works for the Wisconsin DNR out of the Lady Smith Service Center. He is a former high school science teacher. He works with private landowners on county owned forests in Russ County with state owned lands, um, primarily the Flambeau River State Forest, which I think we'll hear a bit about today and occasionally on the Shawamigan Nicolay National Forest through the Good Neighbor Authority. As a ranger, he also has wildfire control responsibilities and enforces burning regulations and timber theft complaints. And I'm gonna let Ron tell us a little bit more about himself as well as we get started. And I'm going to let Ron share his screen now. Oh, did we lose Ron? Oh, there you are. Oh, I'm here. <laughs> 
just you on my screen for a moment. Okay. There we go. Okay, so yeah, hi everybody. Uh, I grew up in uh, Southeast Wisconsin actually, far, far, actually where there's very little woods uh, in Kenosha County, we had little farm woodlots, that was about it down there. But I was still always outside, uh, farm ponds, creeks, fields, the little woods we had, squirrel hunting, whatever. And so it was no surprise when I graduated high school, I decided to go to Stevens Point and get a, degree in natural resources. I wound up in the forestry program. And in my senior year of forestry, I said to myself, I, I met some people that were teachers in the teaching program. And I thought, wow, because I'd been with the CNR people all the time. And also I met this other group of people that's the teacher type. And I thought, wow, you know, I could almost fit in with these people. So I got the idea in the back of my head that I might actually like to be a teacher. So I Graduated with my forestry degree, took a job with the uh, Forest Service working out of Park Falls. And I loved my job, but I always had that teaching thing in the back of my head. Well, in, it was either August or September of, of the uh, year I was working with the Forest Service. I saw that there was a project learning tree, uh, project wild workshop being held over at Trees for Tomorrow. So I went to that and over that weekend, I decided I'm gonna go back and become a teacher. The people I met there were just so tremendous. And I said, I'm gonna become a teacher. And so I went back to Stevens Point, got my, I uh, finished up my biology degree, got my teaching certification. And that started act one of my professional life. I landed a job as a teacher in a small school in Russ County here, Weyerhaeuser. Uh, it was a K-12 all-in-one building school. Uh, we had a population of about 230 students, 18 to 20 kids in a grade level. I loved it. You knew the kids from the minute they were in kindergarten and you saw them grow up and you watched them go out the door as seniors. It was just the greatest experience. Uh, that lasted for 18 years. And what happened is our school, like a lot of schools, uh, the enrollment started declining. And so uh, we, the final year of our existence, we were down to 130 kids. Uh, a lot of classes in the elementary didn't even have double digit numbers of students. It was, we couldn't go on. And so it was either we dissolve or we uh, get in together with the, uh, another school. So we did combine with Shatek and became Shatek Weyerhaeuser School. But for me, it was just never the same. And I decided, uh, I'm going to make a change. I got a, I, I no longer have that passion I used to have and I need to move on because teaching is not a job you want to do when you don't have that passion anymore. And so I decided to take a leap of faith and go back to my natural resource roots, which was the start of act two. I took a job as an LTE forester on the Flambeau River State Forest. LTE stands for limited term employee. I wasn't even full time. Uh, actually, I, what I ended up getting was two full two LTE positions. So I was full time. I worked full time all year round, but I didn't get any of the benefits, at least for a year. After one year, I was able to get uh, health insurance again and then back into the Wisconsin retirement system. But I was only making half the salary I made as a teacher and I didn't get days off and things like that. But it was a foot in the door. And about a year and a half later, I wound up having the opportunity to become the forest ranger, forester ranger here in Ladysmith. And I took that position uh, and I've been there ever since. And I assume I'm probably gonna finish my working career here in Ladysmith. So this is my act two now. Uh, I uh, get to work as Gretchen, uh, alluded to, I get to work on the county forest here in Russ County. I get to work on the Flambeau River State Forest. I still get to do a lot of teaching in that I get to work with a lot of landowners, private landowners, and they are always looking to learn more about their land. And then also fire control is also a big part of my duty now uh, at certain times of the year. And so it's a very uh, good job because it's always something different going on out there. Today though, we're gonna to talk about 
the public forests and managing our public forests and our public forests. And if, for those of you that may have tuned into other the previous uh, presentations, uh, I know they've covered these before. So we'll, we'll go through them again though. Um, public forests provide uh, a variety of services to us free of charge. Recreation is a big one. Uh, in a lot of, or for a lot of people, public lands are the only places they have to go to find recreation and recreation op opportunities. Wildlife habitat, obviously our forests provide a lot of wildlife habitat for a wide host of species. Watershed protection, um, and as we'll see when we look at some of the state forests, some of the state forests were designed, the Flambeau River State Forest is a good example at, for you know almost explicitly or initially to protect that uh, a unique water source or sources that were there. And then economic opportunities. Uh, here in the north, in the northern uh, third of the state, northern half of the state, uh, our public forests are provide economic opportunities. They're economic drivers. They're the foundations for many of our local communities. Uh, they're vital parts of the economy and the uh, job job markets up here from, you know, from stump all the way to finished product. And so it's very, uh, it's a very important resource out there. And there's a variety of other reasons our public forests are important. Those are the biggies. Uh, our Wisconsin forest lands, um, we have just under 17 million acres of forested uh, landscape in Wisconsin. Almost 70% of that is in private ownership. So 30% is in public ownership. The uh, federal forests have about one, uh, a little, uh, one and a half million acres. Uh, the county forests have about 2.5 million acres and the state forest is just over a million acres. All of these properties are public lands. They're open for uh, public to use. And so that's, they're there to meet the, you know, the ecological, social, cultural, economic demands as we already talked about that are, and that's what our forests provide for us. So we'll start out with the county forest system. Um, we have 30 county forests in uh, Wisconsin, and they range from a very small acreage amount in Adams County, only 140 acres, to up in Douglas County, over 280,000 acres of Douglas County is in the uh, county forest system. And the revenues from these timber, from timber sales on county forests are really important to the economies of many Northern counties. And again, uh, from an employment standpoint, they're also extremely important. Uh, as DNR, we also uh, help out the county forest. Each uh, county has a certain number of hours that the DNR uh, supplies to the county to help them out in managing their forest uh, resources. Second type of uh, public ownership land we have in Wisconsin are the fed, federally owned forests. Um, now this is a map of the whole United States. And as most of you probably know, big chunks of the Western United States. In fact, almost 50% of the 11 most Western most states, uh, almost 50%, just under 50% is in public ownership. Alaska is uh, 60, percent in public ownership. As you look in the eastern part of the country, obviously the map gets less and less crowded with, pub, with uh, federally owned lands. But if you look up here in Wisconsin, we've got a, a smattering between the uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs and the national forests that we have here in Wisconsin. We have uh, a fairly substantial uh, amount of public land here that we get to deal with and we get to, to uh, uh, enjoy. So in, the, in Wisconsin, we have the Schwamigan Nicolay National Forest. And again, it's about uh, a million and a half acres. And it's managed to provide for multiple use sustained yield. Multiple use in that it really encourages lots of user groups 
to be able to access and use this forest while also providing a sustained yield of timber that again, it, it, it suggests that it's gonna be important both for recreation, but it's also important for timber, uh, growing timber and, and harvesting timber. And those two things are not mutually exclusive. In fact, they're, they go hand in hand in most cases. Uh, you know, just an example of the multiple use part, when I was working for the Forest Service for that year, uh, while, the, while I was up there in Park Falls, they actually built a campsite uh, over by the Smith Rapids campground. If anyone ever goes up there camping, uh, they built a campground specifically for people that were horseback riders. We, there were hitching posts and, and different amenities that would cater to uh, horseback riders. Uh, so again, and there were uh, motorbike trails that were built, you know, specific user groups, multiple use and sustained yield is the driving uh, management scheme for our national forest. The national forests, um, you know, it got where, because of some budgetary constraints, um, you know, a lot has to do with the fires going on out west. A lot of the, the federal budget for the forest service was being gobbled up with the western fires. Uh, you know, staffing levels here in the in, in, in across the country, but here in Wisconsin, we were just having a hard time keeping up doing all of the having staff available to do all the work to keep up with managing the national forests. So the farm bill back in uh, 2014 or 15 uh, included something called the Good Neighbor Authority, which gave the uh, states uh, the ability to join in with the uh, uh, federal forest system and help them manage their uh, resources. And that's called the Good Neighbor Authority. And we've been, do we've been helping them out ever since 2016. And so we get opportunities. It's not a big part of my job. Um, I, as needed, I can go out and help on, uh, with some special projects with, uh, within the National Forest. But uh, other, other DNR foresters spend a, a, a good chunk of their time working uh, within the federal forest system. So the last group of uh, public lands that we have here in Wisconsin is the uh, state forests. And so we've got, uh, what I've got here is a, a map that shows all the state forests, parks, recreation areas uh, around the state. And they're important for the same exact reasons as our other federal properties were. Uh, there's a map though of the county forest systems and oops, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. My question is, does anyone notice a difference in these two maps? And I know given this format, it's gonna be hard for anybody to answer. So, well, the difference is a lot of our state parks, recreation areas, and even a few of our state forests are really located in areas where there are no county forests and there's no federal forests. And so the important, you know, these, that's important because these, these, these places, these uh, publicly owned properties provide recreation opportunities for a lot of people. You look at the number of people that live in the Madison, Milwaukee, Green Bay, you know, Fox Valley areas where there are no other public lands, they, these become very important. And that was really evident this spring uh, and summer and actually throughout the year with the uh, COVID-19 and people having all this, you know, time home alone and wanting to get out and use those uh, properties. Okay, so this is a, a map of the state forests. And we're gonna primarily just talk about the activities that go on on what are called our six Northern state forests. We also have the Kettle Moraine state forest down here in Southeast Wisconsin and Haven Woods right along the lake uh, down near Milwaukee, uh, Point Beach, getting up towards Door County. But we're gonna look at uh, the six and, and talk about the function of these Northern forests, Black River Falls State Forest, the Peshtigo State Forest, Northern Highland State Forest, 
the Flamble River State Forest, which we'll talk most about, uh, Brule River State Forest, and Governor Knowles State Forest. These are, uh, our, our northern forests are mandated by state statute to, to uh, exist, again, for, to, provide, to provide recreation and you know, our social and cultural needs, ec ecological needs, but also to practice sustainable forestry to help with our, to provide those economic drivers that many, these areas of the state rely on. Uh, and again, recreation, is important and forest management, they go together, they can work together. When we do forest management, a lot of times that helps out the wild, not a lot of times, it always helps out the wildlife eventually, if not immediately. Hey Ron, this is Gretchen. Yep. Um, I'm gonna ask a quick question and you can let me know if now is a good time to answer if you wanna save it for later, cause I'm not sure you might be covering this, but sure. Janice is wondering who is responsible for reforesting cut over public forest? The company that cut the trees, the county, or the DNR? Yep, I will be covering that later. Excellent. Good question, though. So, oh, I'm going to go back here just for a second. Uh, so, here's the Flambeau River State Forest, uh, located right up here in the boundary of uh, uh, Sawyer, Rusk, and Price counties. And the Flambeau uh, River State Forest um, was purchased in, in 1929, uh, 3,112 acres. And then on November 29th, 1930, it was officially named the Flambeau River State Forest. So this is a good time to have this presentation because we are only less than a week out from the official 90th birthday uh, for the Flambeau River State Forest. Those of you that are all the Leopold fans um, may have read the book, San County Almanac, uh, probably read the essay, The Flambeau uh, in there where he describes a trip down the river and how special it was. It was, it was his favorite Wisconsin river and he really championed it. Several local individuals in the Phillips area were also very important in pushing to get that initial 3,112 acres set aside. The Flambeau obviously in the logging era had a long history of being a very, you know, a lifeblood of the timber that was harvested and coming out of the North Woods heading down to point south. So we have a Flambeau River State Forest in 1930, quite small at that time, but also what's going on at that time is the cutover's over and lumber companies now have all this land that really isn't good to them anymore for anything. So they're looking to get rid of it. And so the state takes on uh, a lot of this land. And as far as the Flambeau River State Forest goes, by 1946, the forest now has 65,000 acres. It's getting bigger, but and like most forests tend to do, it's still going to keep growing. But in 1946, we're up to 65,000 acres. In the early 50s, they built the original Flambeau River State Forest headquarters right on the banks of the Flambeau River. Uh, it was very much like a little log cabin. And this served as the headquarters from the early 1950s all the way until 2014. When I first work, started working on the Flambeau Forest, this is this is my off this is where my office was. Uh, nine to ten full-time individuals worked out of here, plus limited term employees, which I was at the time. Incredibly tight, cramped, small quarters. Um, you really learned the definition of the word efficiency. In fact, we were so efficient, our copy machine was in the bathroom. So you could get all kinds of work done in, in there because that's how efficient we had to be. Unfortunately, the basement oftentimes flooded uh, because of the groundwater was so close to the, we were so close to the water table. Uh, so storage of materials and, and files and things like that, it just got to be, uh, it, it was too much. And so in 2014, a new headquarters was built, much more user-friendly, 
not just user friendly for the staff, which it definitely is a lot more space and uh, ease of uh, storing things and, and, and more securely, but also user friendly for the public. Uh, there's a nice welcome area uh, that visitors can come in and, and get information about the forest and their stay there. There's uh, shower facilities. A lot of people use this forest. It's very remote. Um, if you're going to be up there camping for the week, uh, it might be nice to get a shower once in a while. They got shower facilities here that you can come and use. So it's a really, really nice facility, uh, the new headquarters. And that again was finished in 2014. You really can't talk about the Flambeau River State Forest without talking about an event which occurred on the 4th of July, 1977. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, on that date, we had what was called the Minnesota-Wisconsin deratio. Um, that's a word we've heard a couple other times lately. Just this year, uh, Iowa and uh, some parts of southwestern Wisconsin were affected by a deratio event. Mostly what was blown over in Iowa was corn. The July 4th deratio that hit northern Wisconsin took down a lot of trees. It was a major uh, natural occurrence. 850,000 acres of forest were impacted across Northern Wisconsin. And as you look across the track here, the darker the shades of red, so these pinks are wind speeds of anywhere from 73 to 112 miles an hour. The reds are anywhere from 113 to 157 miles an hour. If you remember where the Flambeau River was located, State Forest was located, it's basically right in the bullseye of where this deratio hit. And just, just to give you an idea, this was 850,000 acres. Uh, another deratio we had in the state of Wisconsin that impacted our forest just happened last year in 2019 in July. Uh, we actually had two different deratio events uh, one day apart. Uh, that really hit Oconto County, Langley County really hard, and also Barron and, and Polk counties really hard in the western part of the state. Uh, that affected about 286,000 acres. And, it, and again, very, it impacted it. The areas that got hit were very severely impacted. That's the same thing that happened here, only on a much larger scale, 850,000 acres. And in the and in uh, Flambeau River State Forest area, we were like in the bullseye. It was a direct hit. In fact, that this spot right here, right, that crosses the river, this biggest chunk of red, uh, in 1973, uh, there was a 391 acre uh, block of old growth hemlock, and hardwood forest in there, the largest in Wisconsin, it had just been designated as a national natural landmark in 1973. In 1977, it pretty much was obliterated. It was for the most part blown down. Um, it's that part of the forest is coming back, but it's a shadow of what it was. The hem, you know, the, the big old growth forest really is uh, just a shadow of what it was. The real legacy of the uh, uh, blowdown of 1977, the duration there, is the abundance of aspen forest type that then regenerated after the blowdown. And as that aspen uh, regenerated in 1977, aspen's normally a species we look to manage on a 50 year rotation age. After 50 years of age, aspen starts to decline and it just becomes less and less uh, uh, viable. So we, we manage on a 50 year rotation. So if you do the math, 50 years from 1977 is 2027. We would have a tremendous amount of land to cut in, in 2027 if we just cut it all at once at age 50. We're not gonna do that. Uh, for obvious reasons. We don't want to cut. We, right now, we still have about uh, about 4,600 acres of 
aspen that needs to be cut in 2027 that's that that age aspen 1977 origin and we don't want to have to cut that all in one year so what we're doing is we're trying to spread that cut out over the next 10 to 15 years we've already started cutting some of it and we're going to continue to and and some of it we'll even let go a little over age 50 just to kind of spread out that cut uh and what that's going to do though is all that young forest habitat that's going to be created is going to be great wildlife habitat for a whole litany of species now i've got some ones listed here are, are shown in pictures here grouse and, and woodcock and elk deer but also just a tremendous amount of other game and non-game species are going to benefit from that young forest that's going to be created over the next 10 to 15 years. The elk is interesting though because the elk were actually reintroduced back into the Flambeau Forest uh, in 2014. A satellite herd was brought in for a herd some elk from up by the Clam Lake herd were trapped and brought down to, to the Flambeau River State Forest area and they were released. And since then they have been, that population has been augmented by uh, subsequent trappings from elk in K Kentucky. And there's a nice herd of elk now on the Flambeau River State Forest. They are branching out and, and really doing well. And I think, you know, all things being equal with the habitat that's being created there, again, because of the 77 Aspen uh, glut that we have, I think the elk population there is going to do tremendously well. So it's, it's really going to be fun to watch over the next uh, couple of decades. So now today the Flambeau Forest uh, has about 92,000 acres and it keeps growing slowly now, but every once in a while a private land holding in holding comes available and the state uh, may possibly purchase it. And so it continues to grow, but the lure that brings people to the, fl the flambeau is really the same as it has always been, even 90 years ago. And that lure is just solitude. Uh, again, one of the neat things about the Flambeau State Forest that I like is on most areas of the Flambeau River State Forest, the cell phone doesn't do you any good. You do not get cell signal. You can be a, get away from it all on the Flambeau River State Forest. And that's just a selling point. That's what people love to see about it. Okay, and this is just a smattering of some pictures from the Flambeau River State Forest. Uh, river camping, the camp, the campsite down here with the tent, uh, riverside campsites are real popular. They're only accessible by the river. So you have to canoe to them uh, in order to use them. There's a lot of beautiful forests. The river is always the central theme or, or, or drawing card. There's fishing, canoeing, kayaking. We, there's, there's lakes within the Flambeau River State Forest. Again, that elk population, that burgeoning elk pop, population there. And again, a cornerstone to this also is also always going to be active forest management. Uh, these things again really all go together, and there's no and a, no reason they can't coexist. One of the big reasons that we can really say with confidence that these kind of activities, both harvesting and recreation, can coexist is because for every state property, we have property specific master plans that guide our management activities. Um, these master plans are put together, not just by, you know, foresters and the uh, manager, the superintendent of the state forests or, or state properties, the public is and all types of user groups and interested parties, anyone who really has an interest in the public is invited to come to these planning sessions and put in, you know, what they see as the important points of what they want to see in the management plan of this state forest. These master plans are redrawn up uh, periodically. And so there's, it's always a, it's a living document. It changes 
it, changes can be made to it. And so there's always a lot of input into what goes on in these forests. Uh, not, not just, again, it's not a top down thing. It's, it, there's a lot of collaboration that goes into coming up with a master plan. So we're gonna get into that, that master plan guides our forest activities then as far as uh, when we come to harvesting, we always go back to the master plan and as far as how we are we gonna go about it. And when we talk about harvesting forests, there are different harvest methods that can be used on different types of forest. Up here in the upper left-hand corner, we have an aspen forest type. The, in the upper right-hand corner, a, a hardwood forest type. The bottom right, uh, a, sw a swamp, uh, swamp conifer, if you want to call it, or tamarack, black spruce type. And then the last one over here in the lower left is a, a black ash uh, swamp. Uh, all of these are going to be managed and harvested a little bit differently. And any harvest system really is just designed to mimic a natural disturbance of one form or another, or maybe multiple forms. Uh, you know, whether it be wind or fire, insect disease. Whenever we manage uh, our forests, one thing we always want to try to figure out moving forward is what forest type would probably grow best on this site. And we, a, a, a system was devised by a man named Kotar that Said, that basically said, hey, if we look at the forest plants in the lower levels and of the forest, we can get a good idea of soil characteristics that we can then use to predict what type of uh, forest type will best grow there. And so forest habitat typing has become a very, uh, has become a big cornerstone in helping to guide our management and our decisions about how we're going to harvest and what type of forest we'd like to see there. If you want to read more about this uh, forest habitat typing classification system, there's a good article on it in the DNR, uh, Natural, Wisconsin Natural Resources Magazine from uh, summer of 2019. So I would uh, urge you to take a look at that. Uh, and it describes it in a lot more detail. Uh, clear cutting is a word that is a dirty word in many circles. Uh, it's one of those, you know, it's a it's a a, a name that got it, it got some bad connotations hung on it. But the reality is, it's just a word, and it's just a type of harvest that if applied correctly is completely appropriate. Can, is there ways you could clear cut that's inappropriate? Of course there are, but when applied correctly and appropriately to the forest type we're, we have working with and what we want our goals to be for the future forest, there's absolutely nothing wrong with clear cutting. I also have coppice here. Those two words are often used interchangeably even by foresters sometimes Clear cutting is when we remove, uh, basically remove all the trees in a forested area. And we're gonna rely either on someone coming back to plant, replant the trees in that forest, or there's a seed source there that's going to seed in that forest. And so just nature will naturally seed it in. And I'll have an example of that in a second here. A coppice harvest is different it looks the same, we're still cutting down all the trees, or most of the trees anyways. But in a coppice harvest, we're relying on, and we know that the forest type that we're cutting down here is gonna send out vegetative suckering and shoots that are gonna reforest that landscape. No cutting, no planting or seeding or anything like that will be required. In the upper right hand corner here, this picture here, this is a fresh, coppice area. This used to be a stand of kind of a mixed stand of red maple, black ash. There was aspen throughout it, uh, balsam fir. Uh, it's kind of a more wettish site. 
when it got not not wet, it wasn't a swamp or anything, but the soil type was what is was had a wet regime to it. So this was when it was first initially cut. This picture here is that same area one year later. And one year later, we have aspen trees out here now that are already three, four feet tall, uh, pretty much predominantly covering the whole area. It's not exactly the same picture for picture, but this is the same area. We've got a new forest completely growing just off the shoots, uh, the vegetative suckering of those aspen trees that were located in here. All it takes is three, four, uh, good healthy aspen to regenerate a whole acre of aspen. So again, you don't have to have a whole contiguous aspen forest to regenerate an aspen forest. As long as you got enough aspen scattered around throughout it, and it's appropriate, we cut it down and do a, do a coppice, it's gonna come back completely to aspen cover type. This is this other one down here on the lower left corner. Uh, if we used, if we had a tree, say like tamarack, we might want to use a coppice or a clear cut. This is a clear cut. This could be what we would do in a clear cut of a tamarack stand. We cut it in strips. And what we're doing is taking all the trees out of this strip. And then the, the strips that are left are going to be left there to seed then in. And if this was tamarack, tamarack seed by, they have their cone bearing the tamarack would seed into this strip area and the, tamar the young tamarack would start growing in here. Once that was established, then we could come back and cut out these uh, strips that we had left uh, originally. So again, clear cutting and coppice cut harvest, nothing wrong with them. We, they're one of the two main types of harvest systems we use on the Flambeau Forest and in a lot of areas here in, in Wisconsin. The other one that we use a lot is uh, single tree selections. And this is where we try to harvest trees based on their health, uh, their vigor and the spacing of the trees. And we're trying to create a, a forest that's got several age classes of trees. We don't want all one age. Going back to the previous slide, you know, when I clear cut or coppice that area and I get that stand of trees back, they're all gonna be pretty much the same age. In this, type of for harvest system, I can create a forest where we have many age classes of trees. These tend to be harvests that people don't mind quite as much because when I look at the after effects in the upper right hand corner here, this picture here, this is a uh, picture that was taken about six months after this area was harvested using a select single tree selection harvest. These other two pictures, this picture in the lower right, hand corner is about five years after a single tree selection harvest. And the one up here is about three years after a single tree selection. So what's left on the landscape isn't quite so stark and, and horrible looking to people. And so a lot of times people will think, well, this is a good harvest. Why did they cut all them trees down over there? You know, in that clear cut, that was horrible. Uh, again, two different all we're doing there is looking for two different outcomes and two different forest types we're trying to create. Uh, one of the big things, again, trying to create that multiple age classes within this stand. So here's a couple of sugar maple saplings. The one on the left is about an inch and a half in diameter. The one on the right is about two and a half inches in diameter. Anybody wanna guess how old those are? Well, sometimes people are shocked to learn that trees with that, you know, that small of trees could be this old. They're 38 to 40 year old, these two particular ones. In fact, they're the same age, both of them, even though the one's larger, they both uh, are the same age. They're both somewhere in the neighborhood of 38 to 40. The rings are pretty tight in there, even with a magnifying glass and get hard to count. I've seen, uh, sugar maple saplings that were three, three and a half inches in diameter that were over 80 years old. Sugar maples are incredibly uh, good at surviving in low light conditions. They're very shade tolerant. They can just wait their, for their chance in the understory 
waiting for holes in that canopy, whether it's a disease, whether it's a lightning strike, whether it's a wind event that blows over the tree to give them a chance, or if it's a harvest that comes in and selectively removes trees. We're always looking to give these young trees a chance to get up and become big the future forests that, they, that they're waiting to be. And then when we also in harvest and, and do single tree selections, we're also not only just releasing the existing saplings that are there, we're also hoping to open it up enough in the canopy to encourage young seedlings to start growing again. We're always thinking about how can we get natural regenerations to take over here? Because kind of getting back to that question that was asked by Dennis earlier, we don't want to have to go and replant stuff if we don't want to. Um, sometimes you have to. If we cut down a pine plantation and there's nothing else there, then we're probably going to have to go, or not probably, we're going to have to go back in there and do, do some replanting of that. Um, but generally speaking, we try to uh, get around that by uh, letting nature do it and, and using harvesting systems so that nature does it. We have a uh, system uh, of for for uh, inventorying all the stands and forested areas we have within our state and county forests called the Whispers uh, system. In here, we have all kinds of tabular data where for every we break the landscape up into compartments, manageable man. man manageable management areas. And then we break those compartments up into individual stands, you know, parts of forests that are different from one another. So this particular one is stand 16 in compartment eight. And we're gonna be going through a few things with stand uh, 16 compartment eight here, but it tells us what kind of forest it is. It's a Northern hardwood forest tells us the size of the forest. It's a small uh, uh, saw log type stand, 11 inch to a 15 inch uh, diameter trees. And it also tells us the relative stocking, how, how dense are those uh, small saw log trees uh, stocked in there. Secondary type talks, you know, now all of a sudden we've got the pole size class, five inch to 11 inch trees. And then also it says we've got a lot of uh, northern hardwood seedlings in here also. We've got a habitat type that we talked about earlier. So we got a lot of information stored in here. And this information is put in here by foresters. We periodically go out and uh, do recon to update all this information for our stands. So we're using good current information when we go to make management decisions. Same, this is the same stand now. It just, again, tells us what the major species are in the stand. Again, this was a northern hardwood stand, so I would expect to see sugar maples. And this one has quite a bit of red maple also, white ash, basswood. So it tells us the soil types um, that are there. The invasive species can be noted if we either see this, when this cruise was done, it was uh, the winter time and it's hard uh, at that time of year to see a lot of invasive species anyways. So none were noted at that time. We're always, and we'll talk about invasive species a little bit more later, so I'll save that. Then the last thing I want to show you about the Whisper system as far as the tabular data, it also has on here then a plan treatment. We have a plan, what we're gonna do with this stand. And this one just happens to be part of an active timber sale, so it's, it was planned to be harvested in 2019. And so that's why it's part of an active sale. It's set up and sold already uh, to be harvested. So this is also another part of the Whisper system. This uh, uh, air photo over here is, a, is the spatial component of our Whisper system. So this is the um, uh, photo of the forest landscape We've got a variety of different photos we can put up here. This one's a color infrared. Uh, we can have leaf off photos, leaf on photos, uh, topographic map photos to show us topography. 
So here's, uh, it's just showing, it's the color infrared, different forest types. These are the different stands. These little green uh, lines are all different stands. The, the numbers are different stand numbers. So this is stand 16 here. This is the stand that I showed you all the data from in the, in the tabular side. So stand 16 goes around here and it's got this skinny long part to it and then it comes back up into here. Well, if we look over here, this is when we said this, again, this is part of an active sale. This is stand 16 on the timber sale map. And so this is now part of a sale. And what this is telling me is that this is a select harvest area. It's 59 acres and it tells us that it's bounded by red paint. And we're getting in there, we're gonna harvest all the orange mark trees because this area was uh, single tree selection. Right adjacent to it is this stand, which is actually going to be a coppice cut. This area, we are gonna cut all the trees out of here, one inch and larger, except for certain species. Species like uh, cedar trees, white spruce, uh, any oak, and uh, I believe in this sale, cherry trees were also left uh, to stay on the landscape for wildlife and uh, green tree retention purposes. Otherwise, this area is gonna be cut and coppiced. And what we're gonna get back in this part of the forest, right now it's kind of a mixture of, it relates to this stand right here. It's a mixture of black ash, red maple uh, and uh, aspen. And then there's some wet pockets in here with tag alder and stuff, but it's gonna come back as an aspen forest. So again, we're taking that spatial data, we're transposing it, we're going out in the field, we're putting in lines here to make a timber sale out of it. Because now, and then the last part of this sale are these uh, little strips here. Those are all tamarack black spruce. Like I talked about earlier, we're gonna do some strip cuts in there where we're gonna take out all the trees again, one inch or bigger, except we're gonna leave the white pine, the hemlock and the cedar. So we're trying to set up a timber sale here. Once we get that timber sale set up, now it's up to our logger friends to come in and do the management. And it, we rely on our partners in the logging industry to carry that out, to help uh, you know, improve the quality of our forest as well as regenerate them. Modern logging has changed from the old days. And even, I don't even have any chainsaws on here. Nowadays, chainsaws are still used, but primarily it's done by uh, very advanced equipment, uh, processors, GPS, uh, they have GPS on them, it keeps track of uh, volumes of woods they're cutting. These loggers have to bid on these timber sales and the sale is sold to the highest bidder. And once that sale is sold, then it's, then it's the loggers, you know, job to get in there and do the cutting and cut it. As they cut it, we try to admit, we administrate it. We don't try to, we do. We make visits out there to check on, see how things are going. We can't, we want to talk with the loggers. Hey, how are things going? What are you finding? Are, are you having a hard time with anything? Uh, we try to track, we track the volumes of what, how much wood are they taking out of here? We, you know, when they're falling trees, we're looking to make sure when they're taking down trees and we want them to leave other trees, we don't want them damaging the trees that are going to remain? Are they doing it in a good way? Are they keeping clean their equipment and making sure they're cleaning up any spills and things like that? Uh, you know, rutting, you know, are they causing any problems on the landscape? And, and again, we don't want them to do that. So we, and they don't want to do it either. So we're, we're working together trying to head off those problems so we don't have any issues to deal with. Our forests are managed under third party uh, certification. And cert that certification is important um, because it, it allows us to know, hey, are, and, and the loggers to know, hey, are, are we doing a good job? Are we, are we doing everything we're supposed to? But uh, equally as important, it helps assure the public that the management that is happening here is, is being done in an appropriate and good way. And it involves a variety of things, that certification. And I'm gonna talk about some of them here in the next couple of slides. Hey Ron, well, we, oh, yeah. I'm going to yeah. just break in really quick because we're actually at just about one o'clock. 
Okay. Um, but this is such this is such good information. I just wanted to let people know that I would love to have you keep going if you have the time um, and are willing to do that. And if people do need to get off and uh, go other places, you have other commitments, that's just fine too. Feel free to put any questions into the chat if you still had um, questions hanging out there before you leave and we'll make sure that they get at, um, asked to run before the end. And then uh, you can log back in and look at the recording and find out the answers. So with that, go ahead, Ron. Okay. Um, we try to follow, uh, again, I always keep saying try is we don't try, we do. These best man we have best management practice that we follow on public land activities. And that includes addressing things like invasive species. We have garlic mustard here. And, and in the Southern, well, all over the state, garlic mustard is a problem. It's really a problem in uh, some state parts of the state more than others. Buckthorn, there's a whole litany of different invasive species out there that we wanna make sure that we keep out of our forests as much as possible. Another important part of bus management practice that we fo that we follow is and 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 em employ is how do we get across streams? You know how are we if we got across a stream, we need to do it in the right way so that we don't cause any degradation to that waterway and that watershed. Uh, how do we work around rivers, streams, lakes, and wetlands? These this is called a riparian management zone or RMZ. We have uh, guidelines that we have to follow as far as how we set up harvests and allow harvest activities to occur close to these types of uh, water bodies. Endangered resources, endangered species, threatened endangered species. Here's a goshawk. Uh, we have to take into account these when we're setting up and administering timber sales. I had set up a timber sale it actually was done. I had it all set up, ready to go. The last, I had to go out there one more day just to finish cruising up some uh, part of the sale I, to get the volume of what we thought was going to be cut. On that last day, I happened to find a goshawk in a goshawk nest. That required me to put in then a buffer to around that nest. I had to take it ended up being almost 30, 30 plus acres had to come out of that sale because that goshawk was there. Because again, we have to follow these guidelines. It's not, it's not something that we're it's just recommended. We follow them. We have to. On private land, it's suggested and 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 we encourage it, but on private land, they don't necessarily have to follow the uh, best management practices. Wood turtle is another good example of an endangered resource out there that we often hear on the flambeau. Those are really the two that we often cross paths with the most uh, within our timber sales. We're nearing the end here. Uh, all in a day's work. Uh, you know, the thing I love about my job is every day is different, and every day you get to see just the real cool parts of our Wisconsin landscape from beautiful fall scenery to trees. You know, trees just amaze me the way that the, they can grow into the most tortured of forms uh, and put up with the most, you know, the un most unbelievable insults thrown at them by nature and just genetics uh, and chance and they keep growing. Uh, Wildlife that you see, I came across a couple up in the right-hand corner. It's actually a couple of deer fawns. You can see the one a little, a uh, little bit. Again, they're hidden in the brush there. I didn't want to get too close to get, disturb them too much. And then the porcupine down there. I, I found out how hard it is to get a good face shot of a porcupine. I wanted to get a, him looking at me. I, I went around him about two, two or three times trying to get a shot of his head looking at me, but he was very shy. He kept turning his tail to me. Cause I'm sure he thought I was going to try and get him. I didn't want to stress him anymore. So I tried a couple times and I left them alone. Always something new though. That's, it's a really cool job. So how do you get this kind of job or jobs related to uh, public forest uh, management? First of all, the breadth of jobs out there in public forest management is tremendous. 
uh, you know, if you want to be a forester or a silviculturalist or a pathologist or an entomologist, uh, you're going to need an advanced, you're going to need a, a four-year degree uh, or for some specialty areas, even advanced beyond that uh, to become a, a forester. But there are a lot of other opportunities out there uh, to get involved in public lands management where you can uh, do that with less than a four-year degree. Uh, wildlife technicians, uh, like down in the lower left-hand corner here, they're they do a lot of our heavy equipment work. They also do though our, uh, do a lot of forestry work. So they get a lot of training uh, just like the foresters do in forestry. Um, customer service people um, are very important for our department uh, and our forests because they're kind of the front lines. They get a lot of the questions, they get a lot of the contacts and they, uh, again, they're public forests and we deal with the public a lot. Um, so a lot of, some of these jobs are actually available. You wouldn't necessarily need a, a, a four-year degree or even a two-year degree. Again, like everything else, the more education and feathers you can put in your cap, the more, you know, better chance you probably have of getting positions. But there are a lot of LTE, the limited term employee positions out there on our public properties that employ either college students uh, or just people looking for part-time work that are looking to do things on the forest properties, uh, maintaining the uh, uh, either state parks or state forests. Loggers are another good example of a job that, that's out there that Again, you wouldn't necessarily need any schooling to do it, but we need more and more loggers. Uh, logging is sort of like the hunting. Uh, it's kind of an aging uh, demographic and we need to get more young loggers into logging. Then as far as any special skills, I would say I put down some here. I, Obviously, to me, if you're going to be any job, really, you should be a hard worker and you should be a self-starter and have a good attitude and be on time, punctual. But for me, especially, you need to have a passion for your job and, and have that passion. And when, it, when you go to interview for a job, you should communicate that, hey, I would really have a passion to do this job. Uh, written and oral communication skills are very important because, again, you're going to be dealing with a public very often. Again, because you're dealing with that, profit, that public, soft skills are very, very important. You have to know how to deal with people sometimes when they're not at their best or having their best day. Uh, you gotta have a tough skin, two ways to have a tough skin. You're gonna be out in the woods a lot with ticks and mosquitoes, hot, cold, freezing. It's not an easy job a lot of the time. Uh, it's not, it can be a very uncomfortable job. You also have to have a tough skin, again, getting back to that public element that, hey, if people say stuff that, you know, that against, you know, against the DNR or against why you're cutting this or that, you have to be able to let that stuff roll off your back and, and take it, you know, just take it with a grain of salt. Always listening and being respectful, but you just have to have a, a tough skin. And then be a lifelong learner. That's always important in any, any, any part of any, uh, walk of life and technology is you know we we've learned that most of you uh your kids probably can teach you stuff about computers and and phones and stuff okay we are almost there uh any additional comments uh or or questions or information that you need please feel free to contact me um i love to talk forestry so uh please let me hear let me hear from you and then just the last thing, our, you know, the future of our public forests in Wisconsin is very bright. Um, our forests have reestablished itself since that cutover of the late 1800s into the early 1900s. But, you know, we're not out of the, we're never out of the woods, so to speak. Um, we have new issues emerging, you know, climate change is definitely something that we are studying, researching, monitoring, trying to figure out what are the effects of climate change going to be on our forests, budgets always going to be an issue. Invasives, all, that's good. they're going to be with us now. Emerging diseases and pests, 
uh, you know, emerald ash borer, good example. It's, you know, those of you in the southern uh, two thirds of the state, you see what's happened with emerald ash borer and how devastating that can be. So our public forests are important and for a lot of reasons in Wisconsin, uh, social, cultural, ecological, and economic, and they will continue to be well into the future. Thanks a lot. Any questions? Thanks, Ron. Um, I'm going to have you stop screen sharing if you can for a moment. I'm going to put my screen back up. Okay. Sorry for going over a little there. No, that's all right. Are people seeing where we left off and what's next in the series? Yep, we see it. Okay, perfect. I want to make sure the correct information came up. So while you're um, still collecting your thoughts and uh, questions for Ron, I just wanted to remind uh, everybody what's coming up next. So in January, uh, we are going to focus on our forest inventories in the state and the different ways that we collect information and what we're collecting information about uh, regarding Wisconsin's forests. And then in February, we're going to take a look at how we manage our forests for species of special concern. Uh, in March, we're going to take a focus on fire and fire management in the state. April is going to be all about urban forestry, and we know that Arbor Day uh, also falls within April as well. And then uh, in May, we're going to take a look at invasive species and how we're protecting our forests from invasives. So uh, we're still working on the registration materials for some of those. The one, uh, as you can see there for January is up and open. I know that some of you have already registered already, but if that's an interest to you, uh, feel free to register for that today, register for that uh, today or anytime in the near future. And then uh, the February and on ones will be working to get that registration material up and running soon. And with that, um, do we have any additional uh, questions for Ron? Steve, did you see um, my chat shrunk here? Were there any other questions or comments in the chat? Um, the one comment was, um, Thanks, Ron. Have have to run to class now, <laughs> and um, he appreciated Matt. your work with LMHS. Yeah, that's from Matt Bunton. Um, but I haven't seen other questions. I think Janice had one more question in there earlier about the location of the oh, yeah. the river. Oh, did I miss that? Uh, where is the Flambeau headquarters building located? Near which town or what road? Oh, well, that's the cool thing. It's really not located near any town. Um, it's on Highway W, right almost smack dab in the middle between Phillips and Winter, Wisconsin. So it's, it, it, I guess Phillips would probably be the, the closest town, a little bit closer, it's probably 12 miles west of Phillips or about 15 miles southeast of Winter, right on Highway W though. Okay. Once you're going right. down W, once you hit the Flambeau River, that's it. And the headquarters is right there. It's right on the Flambeau. I, I had a question, Ron, if, if you're willing. Yeah. Um, this is Kate from LEAF. And yeah. I think the elk reintroduction and, and elk projects are fascinating. I'm yeah. wondering how easy it is to encounter elk in some, like, are they pretty sparse still or like if you're walking around I used to work in like glacier and you'd be walking around and you'd see moose is it kind of like that or what is the population like for no well it could be like that if you happen to know where the elk are hanging out at the time and just have the one year we were uh, last year in fact we were marking uh, uh, a, a select cut area that was right adjacent to a area that had been coppiced a year or two previously and elk were there all the time you know we'd go out you know we'd be out marking and you could look out in the clear cut or the coppice sorry you'd look out in the coppice and you could see elk standing out there um but 
if you, you know, if you were just to come up for the day and walk around the forest, uh, it would be, what I would suggest is stop in at the headquarters and ask somebody there, hey, where are the elk the most visible? Uh, somebody might be able to help you and say, hey, we've been seeing them down west, you know, west of the headquarters here. They might be able to help you out a little bit that way. I'll, I'll guarantee you though, anywhere you go on the flambeau and walk around, you will see their tracks. The, uh, just about, that's what's amazing to me is how quickly, just about everywhere I walk around up there now, I see elk tracks. You know, it's not, it's not uncommon at all to see their tracks. To actually see the elk, that can be hit and miss. You know, you, you kind of have to know sort of where they're at. You know, they're way less popular, pop, uh, populous than the deer. And as you know, people complain about not being able to see the deer. So, uh, it, it, you know, like I said, if, if I was really coming up here really wanting to see elk, I would just stop in at the office and, and try and get some help from somebody and say, hey, where would be my best chance right now? And they'd probably, they'd probably be able to help you. Cool. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, Janice did have, uh, so she's not with her anymore? Uh, oh, I see. Uh, where did she say it? Oh yeah, is there good information on the Flambeau River if we wanted to canoe but avoid all rapids? Um, but she's not, a, I, I don't know, who can answer her if, if Janice is oh. still on. She's oh. uh, she just she just sent that to you privately rather than everybody. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. okay. Is there a, is there a website that talks about the river and all the uh, places to let in and out and where the rapids are and aren't? Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm sorry, Janice. Um. Yeah. There is actually. Um. Uh. I don't have it right at my finger. If you if you uh, if you just Googled Flambeau River uh, canoe, uh, you know, routes or trips, uh, it'll come up and there's actually, and if you went to the DNR website and went under the parks tab, so go to the DNR website, www.dnr.wi.gov. And then if you go to the parks tab, um, you can find the Flambeau River State Forest. And then on there, it uh, I believe they have a thing on there that talks about the uh, river routes and it gives an estimated time of how long it takes to get from, you know, if you take this section, how long it would take. And then it describes what are the, uh, you know, are there any dangers or anything like that? Generally speaking, the lower you, go down the river from north to south they're just run into more and more of the rapids um if you put in on the northern side of the of the uh forest like off of highway 70 there's a uh landing up there called dick stocks um that section there that first stretch uh south of there is fairly flat water and there's one little rapids area i think but not nowhere near as uh scary <laughs> as some of the <laughs> ones further down uh, all right thanks very much and i just wanted to say um, my family loved you at warehouser so thanks for that oh i was wondering if you <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there can't be very many Zenrosics in the world yeah. exactly <laughs> Wonderful. Anything else from anyone who has a question? Feel free to either quickly type it or just even unmute yourself and ask as well. Gretchen, I know there was one comment um, from Darlene, I believe. Um, she's anxious to share with teachers and students. Do you have an idea when this might be posted? Um, so within the next week. It just depends on uh, how fast Jenny and I are able to download and uh, translate over to uh, everything gets uploaded then to our YouTube channel. And we will, uh, we can let you all know the link from there. And it will for surely appear in the next edition of the leaflet, but we'll usually have it up before that. Great, thanks. Give us just a few days. 
Thank you, Kate, for getting that website up there or that link there. I see it. I think it's from Kate. Yep. Oh, yeah. Kirsten, actually, I think. Oh, Kirsten. Right well, thanks, Kirsten. <laughs> mm -hmm. All righty. Well, with that, I think we'll uh, look to sign off for the day. Thank you so much again, Ron. It was fantastic information. Uh, great job explaining um, our public lands and also the uh, management techniques uh, that you use on them. I think that's extremely beneficial. And um, I I love these because I continue to learn myself each and every time more and more information. It's fantastic. Are we recording still or no? We are. Oh, okay. So but I'm going to turn the recording off here. Um,